Okay, so we wrap up the fight series tonight. And what we've looked at so far is we looked at why we fight. We've looked at how to fight better. We, looked at, um, we also looked at some rules. We've looked at uh, what happens when there isn't a fight. What happens when my spouse won't change or doesn't want to change. And tonight, I thought the best way to close out this time together would be to look at how do you end a fight? How do you end a fight? And what most of us probably think immediately, and hopefully you do, is most fights end with what? Okay, that's true. (laughs) Most. (laughs) Let me tell you, this may be the healthiest marriage ministry you've ever seen on the planet. Somebody tweet that. You are 100% right. If you're married, if you're engaged, all right, pump the brakes, okay? (laughs) Got to be careful there. Other than sex, um, an apology, right? Most fights need, some of you are like, oh, we're supposed to start with that. Yes, it'll make the second thing way better, I promise. Um, Anyways, y'all are too good. Okay, so an apology. Now, here's the thing. Okay, how many of you had a sibling when you were growing up? Okay, Red Room 2, just lift your, uh, lift your hand. Had a sibling. Okay, so I'm sure, I'm sure if you had a sibling, you had a moment where you maybe took something from your brother or your sister. Maybe you knocked him over. My daughter, my, my daughter's older than my son, and she just knocks him over all the time. And, and guess what happens, right? Sarah comes in, and what does she do? She says, Kyla, tell Kaysen that you're sorry. And what does Kyla do? Sorry, Kaysen, and then moves on with her day, right? Do y'all remember that? You used to do that too. Well, here's the thing. It's very interesting. If you think about it, where did you learn how to apologize? You learned from your parents or your grandparents, guardian, whoever might have raised you. We learned from our parents. And so what some of us did, and not by our parents' intention, of course, but by default, we learned how to just say I'm sorry without meaning it very much. Right? It's almost like we practice it our whole life and then we hit 30 years old and we're still doing the same thing to people. Oh yeah, I'm real sorry about that. Uh-huh. Yeah, real sorry. And you really don't care. It's interesting. Now, again, that's not a knock on our parents. And for those of you that are parents, it may be a great thing to evaluate in your process of raising your kids. But the truth is all of us learn, most of us learn from our parents, our guardian raising up. And some of us learn from parents, especially if you're a little bit older, it's possible that your dad said, hey, men don't apologize. That was a big thing for a long time. It's possible that they showed you how to apologize incorrectly. There's many different ways it could be, but all of us absorbed it from somewhere. When the truth is, the best place for us to absorb it would have been from our Heavenly Father. In fact, let me read a verse to you. Matthew 5, 23 says this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, if you're coming in for worship, if we could just simplify that, and there, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. What Jesus said is, before you come worship God, you be sure you clear the air with anyone that has something going on. And that would include our spouses. Now that's a great practice, right? That's a wonderful practice. Now I'd be real worried if the churches today actually honored that. It would, the church would look a little interesting um, Anyways, that's a different topic for a different day. Now, what happens when we start apologizing is by default, some of us do what we're going to call tonight as pseudo-apologies. Pseudo-apologies. These are apologies where we don't really take the blame. We don't really own up to what happened. We kind of just say something in hopes that it might solve the problem. So in case you're wondering if that's you, here's some examples. I have seven of them. Number one, an apology without remorse. An apology without remorse. Here's an example. Here's what you might say. I would never use this word, but let's just say you did. Logically, I'll admit you have a point. You didn't say you are sorry. You just shifted. Apology without remorse. How about a premature apology? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Now can we drop the whole thing? Ever done that before? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Are we, are we good? Are we good, right? You're not really apologizing. You're just trying to get ahead of it. Save yourself some time. By the way, be, always be careful in here. 
I say it a lot. Don't look at your spouse. You know, you can, you can nudge them if you need to, but just don't look at them because then it creates weird discussion time later at the table. Here's a third one. The angry apology. The angry apology. It might sound like this. Okay, I'm sorry. Is that what you wanted? Right? Ever done that before? <laughs> Some of you are like, check, check, check. Okay. How about the excusing apology? It might sound like this. I'm sorry. However, we're going to come back to that in a minute. How about the blame shifting apology? I'm sorry you're so sensitive. I'm sorry you're so sensitive. It's really you, not me. I added that, but that was pretty spot on. But I don't do that, right? <laughs> Except last night. Uh, sometimes I don't work on my message in time, and I'm just teaching you what I learned the hard way the night before. Non-responsible apology. A couple more. Non-responsible apology might sound like this. I'm sorry this whole thing happened. Just, just sorry this whole thing happened. Or here's, here's, here's one. This is a good one. The blame-sharing apology. I guess we really blew it, didn't we? We really did, right? We're to become one, the great mouth of the Lord. We really blew it. And you're thinking, no, it was all you. It was all you. Now, there's actually a ton more of those that we could all throw out and different things we do. Maybe sometimes we give gifts to avoid actually speaking out an apology. There's all kinds of things we do. But the truth is, Paul, apologies are such a key part of the healing process. In fact, there's a couple of things just right out of the chute that I want to say. There's two important rules. Here's the first one. The words, I'm sorry, should never be alone. The words, I'm sorry, should never be alone. Think about it. You do something wrong and you simply say, I'm sorry. There's always that wonder of, well, does, does he or she really get it? Do they really care? Or are they just doing one of those pseudo apologies so that they can move on? Right? The words I'm sorry should always come with something else to help them understand. I'm going to show you what that looks like in a second. But to help them understand that you really genuinely mean what you say. And sometimes we have these situations where we go, well, I, I'm okay saying sorry, but I can't say sorry for these things because this isn't my fault. Only this one. And the word to you and the word to me would be, don't worry about what's not our responsibility. Focus on the one thing, even if it is just one thing that is, and we apologize for that. But we should never use the words, I'm sorry, without anything else. The second little rule, if you will, would be the word but should never be a part of an apology. I'm sorry, but, or maybe however, right? We have something else because the truth is, we're not really sorry. In theory, we are, but we're not really sorry. We want to make sure that you understand that there was something else that happened that I'm disappointed about. Those are just two quick things to think about. Now, there's some essentials to an apology. Now, I'm giving you a very uh, fundamental approach here. This isn't always going to be a checklist as you're going through apologies. My hope and desire would be that all of us would start to absorb these things that we've been talking about for weeks, and they would become natural out of us. Not that, oh, we're about to have a fight. Can you get your book real quick, and we'll go through all the things you're supposed to, right? The fight just either never going to get addressed or it's going to escalate quickly. And that's not really what we want to do. Our hope is that you would absorb these things, and they would just become natural thought process about who we are as men and women and as husbands and wives. So here's a couple things. Essentials for an apology. Regret, responsibility, remedy. Regret. It's realizing that you have hurt someone or caused somebody difficulty. That's the first part. From a deep place inside, you realize that you've done something wrong and it truly does bother you, which leads you to respond with the act of an apology. Words don't mean anything, right, without deep-rooted action, all right, behind it. And sometimes that action takes time. But it's regret. It's realizing deep inside that you've done something wrong. Oftentimes, it's simply wrapped in humility. That we have to get over ourselves and our own frustrations or our own pain or whatever might be going on to the root of it to realize that something has happened, that I have done something to someone else. Then we have responsibility. We must accept total responsibility for our actions. That's what makes apologizing oftentimes so difficult. We have to accept what we've done. So responsibility followed by remedy. We can't go back and fix what we've done, but we can work to make things going forward better. Now here's what this might sound like. Here's a hypothetical apology played out identifying these three areas. Here's a sample. I'm really sorry. I know I hurt your feelings 
and I feel terrible about it, pause, that's regret, okay? You have every right to be angry with me. I shouldn't have said those things to you and I have no excuse for talking to you like that. That's responsibility, okay? Regret, responsibility. Now watch the remedy. I'd like to discuss these things more often so I don't hold it all in and then blow up like that in the end. That's the remedy, right? So you see how that worked. Obviously, that would apology for an over-explosive reaction to whatever the scenario might be. And we know when some of us, our fights are explosive. So this is a very genuine apology that some of us use maybe regularly. But if you notice, it was pieced together in a way that you're recognizing what you've done. You're taking responsibility for your, what you've done. But then you are saying things and making a plan to help that not happen again. But what's harder than apologizing is oftentimes forgiving. Forgiving can be even more difficult. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 18. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brothers sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times, Peter's being a little spiritually arrogant here, seven times that would be above and beyond. But Jesus says to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. In essence, what he says is every time. There should be no limit to our forgiveness, and that should be the same in our marriages. It's hard to apologize. It can be even more difficult to forgive. This works with kids, too, by the way. I want to share with you something. When we say we forgive you, if we follow the 1 Corinthians 13, if you remember we covered that the other day, if we followed the 1 Corinthians 13 model and truly said we forgive someone, what we would really be saying is this. First, I promise I will not think about this incident again. I forgive you, and I'm not going to think about it again. Why? Because love does not dwell on conflict, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 tells us. It would also include, I promise I will not bring this incident up or use it against you. Why? Because love keeps no record of wrongs, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Sound familiar? It also would include, I promise, I will not talk to others about this incident because love does not gossip, 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Now let me pause for a moment there and say this. It is great to have godly counsel in your life and in particularly through your marriage conflicts. But once you've resolved the conflict, we put it to rest and we move on. Sometimes what happens is we'll resolve a conflict but man, deep down inside, it still kind of bothers us a little bit. And so we'll find someone to talk to and we'll keep talking and we'll keep talking. And oftentimes we end up talking ourselves off a cliff because we end up saying things we didn't mean to say. I want to be careful about that. The last one would be when we say I forgive you, ultimately what we're saying is I promise I will not allow this incident to stand between or hinder us again. Why? Because love breaks down walls. 1 Corinthians 13. We have apology we have forgiveness. Now, here's the thing with forgiveness. You know, you've been coming here now for, I guess we've been here six weeks, right? Maybe, maybe longer if you've come before, if you come to this church regularly. But I want to say something that's massively important. The only way for any of our marriages, any of our marriages, to reflect anything that would bring God glory would be for that marriage to be rooted on him. And the only way for a marriage to be rooted on the Lord is two individuals whose individual lives are rooted on him. When an individual and an individual who are rooted on the Lord come together in marriage, that marriage by default is rooted in the Lord. Many people ask, what am I supposed to do? How do we do that? How do we keep God at the center? And the truth is it starts with you individually. The second thing I want to say in this kind of closing time is this. When we think about forgiveness, sometimes in our marriages, we go through things that require an extreme sense of forgiveness. In this very room and next door, this room is filled with people that have struggled, that have made mistakes personally. They've made mistakes in their marriages, from affairs to pornography to abuse and everything in between. It's guaranteed with the size of these two rooms, that that's happened in these rooms. And the fact that you're sitting here, I'm going to believe, is you saying, 
that you've chosen to navigate through that together. The only way we can do that is to understand that God has first forgiven us. You will never be able to truly forgive someone until you can understand what God has first done for you. In fact, we won't be able to truly love someone until we understand that God is the one that first loved us. So I want to encourage you tonight. I don't know where we are. I hope all of us have had a great time laughing and we get to walk out of here and we're still laughing. But I know reality says that there are some of us that, man, this place has been very healthy but when we walk out these doors, our problems are still standing right in front of us. And I wanna beg of you that you would continue to talk to each other, that even before that, you would seek the Lord individually, and by doing that, you would begin to do that collectively. And I wanna ask you that you would strive every day to love your spouse the very best that you can. Will we fight? Yes. Will we have conflict? Yes. Will we blow it? Yes, most of you already did that today. But thank the Lord that by his grace, we can find first forgiveness in him, and then we can find forgiveness in each other. Men, I want to encourage you, and I want to challenge you, that you would lead your families well, because no one else is going to do it. God has given that gift And that gift has a responsibility attached to it, but he's given it to you. He has entrusted it to you. And some of us are not ready. But if you seek the Lord, he will give you what you need to do that well. Wives, I want to encourage you that you would come under the leadership of your husband. You're not his slave in any way, shape, or form. But hopefully you're looking across at a man or sitting next to a man that you love and that you trust You trust him as a man, but more importantly, you trust him coming under the leadership of God the Father. And if you trust that, you should have no problem submitting under the leadership of him in your home. For those of you with kids, I want to encourage you, practice these principles with your kids. We got to learn to apologize genuinely to our kids, to forgive our kids repeatedly, apparently, we're learning. Um, But you also, we want to model for them how to do it well, right? How much, what an incredible opportunity that we have with our kids. So I could go on and on, but in case I don't get the chance to be in front of you again, I want you to know that, man, we love you, but more than us, God loves you. God loves you as an individual, and he loves you as a couple, and he believes that the fact that you're still breathing, he's not done with you yet. There is so much more that you can do and will do, and we pray that this place has been a blessing for you, and if anything, we walk out of here tonight with a little bit better understanding of how we can genuinely apologize and mean it to the people we love most, but also that we might seek forgiveness.